from the small village of Ewin, from the community of Palo Seco, from the twin island of Trinidad and Tobago, a small library operation was birthed in 1991 at a humble open Bible church. Now blossoming as a business and ministry network across 40 nations, Anointing Oil Dynamics Limited is a hub of influence of leaders and Christian workers as the name, ministry and work of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is promoted. Anointing Oil Dynamics brings unique training packages to many, online manuals, a base of Christian films, Hebraic and Christian products from the land of Israel and assist in the returning of Jews back home. Thank you for selecting this product. Please visit us at www.anointingoildynamics.com or email us at anointingoildynamics at yahoo.com. We trust that the love of God will be shared in your hearts through this presentation as we use the eye gate to motivate. Be afraid. We call this Eden. God will be with me. Moses. I will never let them go! <laughs> you will be like God. You surely will not die. I'm not good in these kinds of situations. You know Superman never takes us back. You can tell he's ready. Do you believe in life after death? Where do you go when you leave this earth? Do you believe in heaven and hell? You will believe. The Lazarus Phenomenon We are going to be doing a two uh, session tonight and also next week. Um, 
as we deal with the aspect of till Christ be formed in you. Till Christ be formed in you. Praise the Lord. So, this is a very, very short book, but also a very, very powerful book in terms of what it entails. It's rooted and built up in the faith. Rooted and built up in the faith. In the manuals that you have, I've put it into a lot of details. We'll be going through it here. Um, I may not be going word for word, but at least you'll be able to get the same concept in terms of what is taking place. Colossians is one of the most Christ-centered book of the Bible. In it, Paul stresses the supremacy of the person of Christ and the completeness of the salvation he provides in order to combat the growing heresy in the church at Colossae. So, very interesting in terms of what's taking place. If you feel we are dealing with heresy today, uh, people have dealt with heresy even uh, in other locations and from the very beginning of time. Christ, the Lord of creation, the head of the body, which is his church, is completely sufficient for every spiritual and practical need of the believer. The believer's union with Christ in his death, resurrection, and exaltation is the foundation upon which his earthly uh, life must be built. Relationship inside and outside of home can demonstrate daily the transformation that faith in Jesus Christ in the walk of the believer. So, at an overview in terms of the basic introduction of the book, what we find is that Colossians is, is, is centered around the fact that it's built on Christ in terms of his death, resurrection, and exaltation um, in Scripture. So our relationship with the Lord is what connects us both inside and outside in terms of all of our work that we will deal with in our life. I have an overview here of Colossi, which is the location that the book of Colossians was sent to. And I'm not going to get into that, but that's really just for your own support um, reading in terms of the history of the location, or the history of the town or the city in which part this was actually sent. Now when we look at the title of the book, um, if Ephesians can be labeled the epistle portraying the Church of Christ, then Colossians must surely be the Christ of the Church. I know some time back we dealt with Ephesians. Ephesians focus on the body. Colossians focuses on the head. Like Ephesians, the little book of Colossians divides neatly into half with the first portion being doctrinal, which is chapter 1 and chapter 2, and the second being practical, which is chapter 3 and chapter 4. So there's a clear split in how the structure of the book is designed with the first two chapters being doctrinal and the latter two chapters being practical. Paul's purpose is to show that Christ is pre preeminent first and foremost in everything and the Christian life should reflect that priority. Because the believers are rooted in him, alive in him, and also kin in him, complete in him, it is ultimately inconsistent for them to live a life without Christ. So, very interesting in terms of, um, of this, in that if Christ is alive, is in him, kidding in him, complete in him, we are ultimately therefore to live as if we are led by and operated by Christ. Clothed in his love, with his peace, ruling in their hearts. They are equipped to make Christ first in every area of life. Every area of life. So we are clothed in this love and because of that, whatever we do, because we are surrounded by the things of Christ, we make him priority above everything else. Alright? It's very, very important. So this epistle is known uh, to the Colossians. Uh, that is supported in chapters 1 verse 2. Paul also uh, wanted it to be read 
in the neighboring um, churches of Laodicea. Now, when a letter was sent by any of the apostles, or any of the Bible writers, and if they were to send a letter to Separia, Separia may have five, six, eight, ten, twenty churches, but it is all addressed to the church of Separia. And whichever one receives it, what they will do is they make hand copies of it, distribute it to all of the churches in that location, so that everybody can get the benefit of the letter that is written. So clearly, this letter is written to the Colossians and uh, well, the people of Colossae at that point in time. Evidence for the author: the external testimony of the Pauline authorship of Colossians in ancient is ancient and consistent and the internal evidence also is very good. It not only claimed to be written by Paul, we find this in chapter 1 verse 1, chapter 2 and verse 3 and chapter 4 and verse 18. That should be 2 and verse 3, not so chapter 1 and verse 23, sorry. And chapter 4 and verse 18. But the personal details and close parallel with Ephesians and Philemon makes the case even stronger. So the exact same environment for Ephesians and Philemon is the very same thing that also occurs for Colossians as well. Nevertheless, the authenticity of this letter has been challenged on the, on the internal grounds of vocabulary and thought. In its fourth chapter, Colossians uses 55 Greek words that do not appear in Paul's other epistles. So when they were to examine Colossians in the original language, there are 55 words in the fourth chapter that, that Paul won't use nowhere else. However, Paul commanded a wide vocabulary and the circumstances and subject for this epistle, especially the reference to the Colossian heresy accounts for this additional words. Now, because he had to deal with a unique problem in that location, he had to use words that are unique for that situation alone. All right? And that is why we find those evidence there. The high Christology of Colossians have been compared to Paul's letter, Paul to John's letter, sorry, but John's concept that Christ is the Logos, which is the pre-incarnated Christ. With the conclusion that these concepts were too late for Paul's time. However, there is no reason to assume that Paul was unaware of Christ's work as creator, especially in view of Philippians chapter 2 from verses 5 to 11. It is also wrong to assume that the heresy refuted in chapter 2 referred to the full development form of Gnosticism that did not appear until the second century. The parallel only indicate that Paul was dealing with an early form of the Gnostic teaching that exists in that time. Date and setting. Colossae was a minor city about 100 miles east of Ephesus in the region of the seven Asian churches in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, which is the seven letters to the seven churches. And um, both Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians were evidently written around the same time and under the same circumstances, judging by the overlapping themes and the personal names that were indicated in each one. So one of the things you'll see in the wrap-up of these epistles is that you will see Paul will highlight individuals. He will bring greetings, he'll bring salutation, and you'll actually find some things in name repeat in, in Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians, which adds value to the fact that they were all part of the same group or the same audience and written around at the same time. On his third missionary journey, Paul developed uh, Paul's devotion devoted most of his third year to the Asian ministry center in Ephesians or in Ephesus and that's why he was able to influence all of these locations. So the best calculated or recorded date 
for the writing of Colossians is around AD 60 to AD 61, uh, which makes it very, very close to even the time of Christ, because Christ will have operated around AD 29, AD 30, 31, 32, thereabout, which is between 30 to 40 years of the time of the um, of the actual apostles operating on the earth. Team and purpose. Every book has a purpose. Every book has a team. The resounding team in Colossians is the preeminence and sufficiency of Christ in all things. That means Christ is able to suffice. Christ is able to be uh, the full benefit that any believer wants. The believer is complete in him alone and lacks nothing because in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Chapter 2 and verse 9. He has all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Chapter 2 and verse 3. There is no need for speculation, mystical vision, or ritual regulations. As true the faith in Christ, as though the faith in Christ, sorry, was insufficient. So Paul was addressing the Colossian people and said, listen, if you are in Christ, you don't have need for nothing additional. Because in him is, the, is all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul's predominant purpose then was to refute a threatening heresy that was devaluing Christ by a positive presentation of his true attributes and accomplishments. A proper view of Christ is the antidote for heresy. Well, the manuals you have is yours, you're free to highlight and write it up, and I want for you to highlight that particular one that is here. A proper view of Christ means that you do not need to add anybody or anything additional to your Christian faith. Are you there with me? It is the antidote for every heresy. Paul also wrote this epistle to encourage the Colossians to continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. Uh, we find evidence of this in chapter 1 and verse 23. So they will grow and bear fruit in the knowledge of Christ, chapter 1 and verse 10. A firm adherence to the true gospel will give them stability and resistance to, to opposing influence. Another purpose in the mind of the apostle is, to, is reflected in chapter 3 from verse 1 all the way down to chapter 4 and verse 6. Paul wanted the, the Colossians to understand the implication of the preeminence of Christ not only for doctrine but also for practice. You see, it is great for us to know the theories of scripture. But it's the next thing for us to live it. Alright? And when we can live it, it's a whole different game ball. The supremacy of Christ is one side of the coin. The submission to Christ is the other. So I recognize that Christ is superior to all of the backgrounds, culture, religions, heresy, trainings, whatever theories of man will God, He is superior above it all. But more than that, I as a believer who is following Christ must also be willing to submit my life to the supremacy of Christ. So that that supremacy will be able to flow through my life. So the believer's position in Him, in chapter 3 from 1 to 4, provides the basis and the power for a transformed life in every location. Key is the Colossian. Well, the key word in the entire book is preeminence of Christ. Key verses, and even in Sunday school, I'll tell you we have to memorize this. Key verses is chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, and then chapter 3, 1 to 2. Chapter 2, 9 to 10 declares, for in him, Dwell in all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, this is a very, very strong, these two words are very, very strong. Because we are talking about all of the mind, heart, intent, purpose of God the Father. 
all of God's vision and all of the will, desires of the Holy Spirit. And now in Jesus Christ while he is on earth and all three of them dwells in him bodily. That word bodily makes it, brings it not in, it moves it from the supernatural world into our world. Bodily brings it tangible, makes it literal, makes it visible, makes it available for you can handle, touch, taste, understand. In other words, that all that God is, is in Christ on the earth. That's what it's referring to. All right? So, while the scriptures have indicated that there is clear evidence in terms of the supernatural and the, and the supreme power of God, if a man were to see God, he will die because he lay aside his glory. We can now see God in a bodily form, in the person of Christ, and, and, and the other two individuals are fully there. And we have a, a model before us to be able to identify who Jesus is. I know Philip at one point in time said, he's saying, oh, he says, show us the Father. And Jesus is telling him, he said, if you see me, you see the Father, because I am the Father, I want yes. So all of them, not just Jesus alone, while he is the person that, uh, that lay aside the throne and come down here, but because he's in alignment with the Father, and he is in oneness with the Spirit, both of those individual thinking, concept, mind, lifestyle are in Christ's body. Because remember, Jesus is not doing his own will. He's doing the will of the Father. Are you there with me? Alright? For in him God in all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And now watch this. And you are complete in him. So you have all of this in Christ. And then if you are connected to Christ, you are now complete in Christ. Who is the head of all principalities and power? That now shows you the level of authority you have. Then chapter 3 verse 1 and 2 says, If he then be raised with Christ, see those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on things on you. My dear sister mentioned that people trying to break into she knows. Jesus said that you know. See they build treasure down here. He said you have mocked. You got have rust. He said thieves will break in. They fulfill it by glory. Thieves will break in. He said, well, when you build the kingdom of God, he said they can't break in up there. Can't break in. Alright? So sometimes, yes, we live in this world. And we need the support mechanism of this world to be able to help. But we don't set our affections here. We set our minds on things above and not on things in the world. So you get promotion, great. You don't get any promotion. You don't really bother. You see them with Christ. You have all the wisdom that is it. Alright? Because of your connection with it. Key chapter is chapter 3. Chapter 3 links the three teams of Colossians together, showing the cause and effect relationships. Because the believer is risen with Christ, and I know sometimes you may come from a particular religious grouping, where they put all the weight on the debt. How we did, did we did, all this kind of stuff. But the victory is not in the debt. The victory is in the resurrection. As a matter of fact, the only reason why they highlight the death is because of the resurrection. The only reason why they highlight Christ's birth is because of the resurrection. Christianity is built, the entire Christian world is built on the fragrance of an empty tomb. It had no death sent in it. Fragrance of an empty tomb. Because the believer is risen with Christ, he is to put off the old man and to put on the new, which will result in holiness in all relationships. In all relationships. So these are the, 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 the major foundation of the book of Colossians. So we are in Christ, we put off the old man, we put on the new man, and because of that, we shall be able to live a holy life. The Bible says, be holy, fire holy. You can only do that with a new man. 
only resurrected Christ that is now flowing in your life. Now, Christ in Colossians. This singularity, chronology, Christological book, is centered on the cosmic Christ. One, that he is the head of all principalities and power, chapter two, and wisdom. He is the Lord of creation, chapter 1, 16 to 17. He is the author of reconciliation. We find that in chapters 1, 20, and also, uh, also chapter 2 as well. He is the basis for the believer's hope. We have a hope, and that is because Christ is risen. We have a hope. He is the source of the believer's power for a new life. Now I know there are times it is difficult to, 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 to totally let go from the things of the world, but the more you let go, when you let go, you have to also cling on. The Lord has let go and remain in the air. There is a releasing, but there is a putting on. There is a putting off, but there is a putting on. And the more you put off, is the more you put on. And the more you put on, you'll put off. That's how it works. All right? So it's the source of the believer's power for new life. The believer's redeemer and reconciliator. Reconciliator. He reconciles us back to God. So, open Bible that we give you. We can give you a card. We can give you a certificate. We can give you all kind of thing that is there. When you are in trouble, you need Christ to be able to help and to redeem. He is the embodiment of full deity. All that God is, is fully loaded in the person of Christ. Fully loaded. He is the creator and sustainer of all things, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. He is the head of the church. He should be your head as well. He's the head of the church. All of us as ministers and leaders, we are under his direction. And the day we don't take direction, he will move us out because he's in charge. He's in charge of Separate Church. He's in charge of the church in Trinidad. He's in charge of the church in America. He's in charge of the church in China that may be underground. He's in charge of the church in Russia that now they're told that they cannot go outside and evangelize. He is in charge of the church, not the politics of the day. He's the head of the church. He is the resurrected God man. As God, he's all as God, but as man, he's all as his man. And then he's the all-sufficient savior in chapters 1 and verse 28. So, in four chapters, Paul pens the divinity side of Christ, showing that, yes, he was a human being, but in him has the full weight of deity and the full weight of all who God is in Christ, in these four chapters in the book of Colossians. Characteristics. No other book in the New Testament set forth more fully or defended the universal lordship of Christ more thoroughly. So if you have to deal with people that don't believe that Jesus is God, this is the book. This is the book. As a matter of fact, what I showed you here just now, you could take just these points alone out of Colossians and show them evidence that the man Christ Jesus is the Lord God of the universe. This is book that Paul used to refute anybody who called him and he's just a good teacher, he was just a prophet, he was just a next man. He was just a next God. This is the book that Paul highlights to show for a fact that you can utilize to defend the universal lordship of Christ thoroughly. Combative in tone and abrupt in style, Colossians bear a full resemblance of Ephesians in language and subject matter. Over 70 of the 155 verses in Ephesians contain expressions echoed in Colossians. That's why they, they run like twin books. On the other hand, Colossians have 28 words found nowhere else in Paul's writings and 34 found nowhere else in the New 
Testament. Why? Because he's defending the supernatural side of Christ. He's defending the divinity of Christ. And that is why he's pulling from such heavy words to be able to indicate what is going on in this book. Common statements found in the book of Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All things were created through him and for him. So there's evidence of him being created. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Read this one again, and I'm going to say it again because of how powerful it is. For in him dwell the fullness, that's a heavy word, the full big the fullness, not the boy long stay, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. These three was fullness, Godhead and bodily. In those short sentences, carries extreme great depths of the way that he selects. Chapter 2 and verse 9. But Christ is all and in all. So he is all things, but he's also in all things. Chapter 3. And verse 11. Put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If any has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgive you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Every time you use the love of Christ, you are actually using the bond, the bonds of perfection. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Not to men. Colossians chapter 3. And verse 23. So these are some very, very common statements that you will hear people make them all coming out of the book of Colossians. Contribution to the Bible. Colossians is characterized by its high Christology as it exalts as the as it exalts sorry, the creator and the redeemer. He is the central of all belief and behavior. Now that's powerful. Huh? It is not just what we believe. We have to behave how you believe. You can't say you're a Christian and you're behaving like something we can't put our, our finger on. Alright? Your, your behavior should follow your, be, your belief. Paul uses rich and even redefined terms used by the heretical movements by filling them with orthodox meaning. Even through this style, it is not a piercing or rigorous as that of Galatians or Romans. The intense concept betrays the underlying controversy. There is no Old Testament reference in this epistle. So one thing that can be challenged that people say you know, there is no evidence of the Old Testament in Colossians, that's true, because he's dealing with the resurrected Christ. Now, when we compare Ephesians and Colossians, we can see that there are some similarities between the two. Both of them are written in prison, both of them are carried by the same individual that stresses on wisdom, knowledge, um, mystery, there are similar passages that are there. Ephesians, on the other hand, emphasizes the church as the body of Christ in a general sense and universal. Whereas Colossians focuses on Christ as the head of the, of the, of the church, or the head of the body, specific to that particular location. Both of them are split into two parts. Yet the first half is positional and the second half is practical. All right? Ephesians is more reflective and quiet. Operates. Great, so I'll tell you all about that. How does it apply to me? Personal application. 
Because this is an age of religious pluralism. In other words, when you have different um, religious groupings with the ones running parallel with Christianity. And also you may have mixing. That is where people will take the truth of God and they will mix it with other teachings again to bring in unity. And there's a, there's a big drive in our generation with regards to that. Where people are driving after unity as opposed to truth. So there are people going around saying, listen, it doesn't matter what you believe. Let us all to come together in one law. And we will fix it when we get to heaven. Alright? Why that may sound good, if there is a difference at the level of truth, there is a major difference that is it. All right? You cannot be united with something that is contrary to Christ. And that's the problem. Okay? So you have where Christ's lordship is, is deemed irrelevant by many religious groups that believe one religion is as good as the other. And that is where we have problems with. Because it is not a case of you come with your God, I come with my God, we all come in one room and one oh God. <laughs> We have the view that we lay aside all the gods of the world for one true God that came here and conquered death, hell, and the grave. You see, any religion can take you, can introduce you to God, but it's only Jesus can take you to heaven. And that's a big difference. All right? His preeminence is, is denied by many that place the Christian stamp upon the fusion of belief from several religions. Usually hailed as an advance beyond the apostolic Christianity, this blend promises self-fulfillment and freedom without surrendering to Christ. Beware of any teaching that wants to give you self-fulfillment and freedom without the surrendering to Christ. Listen, we are called to repent of our sin, to deny ourselves to follow Christ. If there is no denying, if there is no forsaken, if there is no severing of our past lives, you are not a follower of Christ. And one of the things that happened with the universal religions is to say, listen, you don't have to deny where you man. You come as you are and just join in. We all go in the same location. Jesus is Lord is the church earliest confession. It remains the abiding test of authentic Christianity. Neither the church nor the individual believer can afford to compromise Christ's deity. In his sovereignty lies his sufficiency. He will be Lord of everything or not the Lord at all. That's the position we take. You either follow Christ 100% or make up a decision or make a decision to reject Christ completely. I tell people it's either you're hot or you're cool. If you belong to a religion, belong to the religion. Function there. So at least we know you're there. If you want to follow Christ, then deny everything and come and follow Christ. But don't be on both sides. Don't be hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. The Holy Spirit at work. Colossians has a single explicit reference to the Holy Spirit used in the association with love, chapter 1 and verse 8. Some scholars also understand wisdom and spiritual understanding in chapter 1 and verse 9 in terms of the gifts of the Spirit. For Paul, the Lordship of Christ in the believer's life is the most crucial and clearest evidence of the Spirit's presence. So, the Spirit of God is the wisdom of God, the Spirit of God is the understanding of God, and yes, there is evidence of the Holy Spirit fully involved in the book of Colossians. Well, survey of Colossians, I have a complete write-up on this here, but I'm just going to just highlight how it's broken down. Colossians is perhaps the most Christ-centered book in all of the Bible. 
running maybe as close to as the Gospels itself. But you can, those Gospels have about 14, 15, 18, 20 chapters there about. You have four condensed chapters that deals with Christ as the head of all things. It is, in it, Paul stresses the, the preeminence of the person of Christ and the completeness of salvation. So there are two major topics. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 deals with the supremacy of Christ. And then chapter 3 and chapter 4 deals with the submission of Christ. And I have a breakdown here for you which we're going to get into as we get into the chapter itself with regards to the entire flow of how the book is going to run. There is an outline that you have in your manual. And uh, again, you'll see the supremacy of Christ runs from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 23. And uh, that section splits into introduction, the preeminence of Christ, and the freedom we have in Christ. And then uh, in, the, in the second part, which we will look at in the submission of Christ, we have the position of the believer, followed by the practice of the believer and of course there is the putting off of the old man putting on of the new man and then we're looking at holiness in family life holiness in work life and holiness in public life but the old life is also part of public life too as well all right so this is an overview or an outline of really what it is like in terms of uh, where we are in the book so we want to go now into chapter one so i want to just get into the, the chapter itself and then we're going to break chapter one up a bit and then we'll proceed from here so let me just get the lights down we want to get some volume up for um The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Colossians Chapter 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, 
to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to get now into a more uh, greater depth, and I have some details here with regards to how the book is actually broken up. First aspect, I will write up on top in terms of the character of the individual which we have already covered already uh, in the introduction. From verse 1 to verse 12, we deal with the hope before you. These people were going to heaven. They had heard the word and trusted the Savior. And they had given evidence of their faith by their love for God and God's people. God qualified them in verse 12. They did not save themselves. Now in verse 1, Paul the Apostle, Paul refers to his, apost his apostleship because it was unknown to the Colossians. This reference to his authoritative title signifies equality with the Twelve, because he had seen the risen Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8. Now remember, Paul was not one of the original apostles. He did not walk with Jesus as Peter and James and John and so on. So, he introduced himself as an apostle because he was visited by the Lord directly on the road to Damascus and also other places as well. So he's identifying himself as an apostle using the authority of the apostle so that the people at Colossian will, or, or, or the, of Colossi will know for a fact that he has equal weight of authority like any of the other apostles. It refers to the dignity of his office he is clothed with authority and endured with power. In his official capacity, he is writing to combat error. So Paul is actually have to deal with the case of error. But he indicates that he is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is of the Lord's ambassador. That means he's not coming with his own authority, but rather he is coming with the authority given to him by the Lord. All right? When a pastor, a leader, a minister stands, they should stand in the authority that is given to them by Christ Jesus. Are you there with me? All right? He's an ambassador of the Lord. He bore his commission and did his work and sought his acceptance. Paul's life and work were ordered by Christ. Verse 1 continues to says, by the will of God. This speaks of his divine appointment. His appointment was not by the twelve, by the religious leaders, by his family, or even by himself. This is an assertion of his divine authority and declaration of his independence of all human authority. And he disclaimed any individual merit or personal power. So Paul is saying that he's operating by the will of God. And then he also identified Timothy, our brother. Timothy here was not an apostle, but rather, but, but rather a brother, a trusted companion 
that was befallen in Rome. As an act of courtesy, Paul included Timothy in the salutation. Timothy was Paul's spiritual son. So yeah, sometimes, you know, we like to talk and we feel as if we alone is the one doing all the job. And there are other people that support you. Right now, we have people on the camera, people on the subsystem, people on the board that is able to support what we're doing here. So if I were to bring a greeting and say on behalf of me, and I don't include the people that are supporting, then I don't extend the courtesy that is due to them. Paul is, yes, he's using the authority of the Lord, but he also indicates, yes, he is an apostle, but he shows courtesy to the people that help him get there. You all follow what I'm saying? So always have courtesy to those that also help you along in service. He identified faithful brethren, believing brethren. This reference to their human relationship. They were fully, they were full of faith, sorry. Trustful, trustworthy. They were loyal to Christ. Paul referred to them as brethren. There is no spiritual uh, normality. God has one spiritual family and all are equal despite differences in culture, background, social status, or racial origin. So Paul referred to all of them as brethren. Yes, he referred to himself as an apostle, but he says, listen, all are we are brethren. We are all one in Christ. We are all co-laborers together in Christ. I may have a greater labor, but I am not greater than you. You understand what I'm saying? All right, my labor might be greater, but it is all working together as one. In Christ is possibly one of the most powerful terms used by Paul throughout his writings, this concept of being in Christ. This speaks of the spiritual position of the believer in union with Christ. This is a real mystical union. It is like being in the earth. There is a big difference if you are off the ship and you are on the ship. You are in the ship. When you are on the job, in the job. When you are in Christ, there are certain benefits that you have of being in Christ. So it shows the brotherly relationship with believers. It speaks of the fellowship they had, the faith they had, and the unity that they had together. Grace, God's unmerited favor. Grace gives us what we do not deserve. Mercy which hold from us what we do deserve. Grace always precedes peace. So you'll notice over and over you'll see grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace comes before peace. Because you need the favor before you can have peace. Alright? Peace with God and the peace of God. Peace here speaks of calm and tranquility of heart amidst disturbing circumstances. Where is it coming from? It's coming from God, who is the source of grace and peace. In verse 3 of chapter 1, we see here he indicate we give thanks. Paul begins with thanksgiving because there is much for which to be thankful. Thanksgiving precedes intercession, praise precedes prayer. Paul called God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray always for you. That means continual Paul practice what he preaches. You know, today people are so busy. Yeah? You tell somebody pray for you, they say, yeah, I'll pray for you. Sometimes one day I should call them, I can ask them if you didn't pray for me. So when people ask me to pray for them, I have actually done it. I say, yeah, I'll pray for you twice coming this week. So I'll time myself to a time. Or I'll pray for you for one week. Or I'll pray for you the week coming. Or I'll pray for you today. So when you make open promises, if God holds you to that, five years, it is still pray for you. So let's put that timeline back to it. All right? Somebody in a situation and so on like that, there is a here of an incident, let's say we hear somebody get into an accident, so listen, yes, next three days I'll cover you in prayer. So commit yourself, but when you do that, you put that gauging mechanism where you yourself is able to fulfill the word that you speak. We don't want to just make um, promises that we cannot keep. Alright? 
Now in verse 4, he said, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, having heard because we heard, there were no secret believer. Paul simply referred to your faith, not your great faith, not the abundant faith or extraordinary faith. Their faith was in Christ. They trusted Christ, committed themselves to Christ, and had a vital spiritual connection with Christ. Their faith was Christ-centered, they rested in Christ, and they were anchored in Christ. Hey, well, let me take that whole section I want to teach you. In terms of the weight that it carries. And of the love, love is a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Romans 5 and verse 5. Love is the evidence of faith. Love is a character, is a characteristic that, in that mark of Christianity. It is not superficial friendliness. Yeah, people could just be a friend and show friendliness, but that doesn't mean that there is genuine love. To all the saints, there were, there were none isolationists. That means nobody was isolated, nobody was separated, nobody was limited by what sector or section they belonged to. They loved everyone of whatsoever position or disposition they belonged to. This speaks of the depth of brotherly fellowship and uh, the breadth of brotherly concern. So the depth of brotherly fellowship and also the breadth of brotherly concern. They were not indifferent to the needs of others, nor disapproving of the deeds of others, nor critical of the motives of others. Verse 5 talks about for the hope. Because of the hope, not to account for the hope, this states the cause or reason for their love. Laid up for you in heaven, the hope that is laid up for you in heaven, stored up like a treasure reserve. The hope Paul speaks of is still future. Now yes, we have a hope now, but there is a hope also that is there in the future. And its nature is still unknown, but its possession is absolutely certain. What we do for Christ today will add value in the future. The word of truth of the gospel, knowledge of this hope comes from the word. Truth in the very essence of the gospel. Paul speaks of faith, the beginning of the Christian life, which lays hold of Christ. Faith rests on the past, Paul speaks of love, love lives in the present and links together faith and hope. Hope looks forward or hope looks towards the future and anticipates the crop. So we connect the past by faith. We use love in the future and then we take hope and book it to the future. So you see, the depth in which she is dealing with. In verse 6, which is common to you, that means present with you, in all the world, the gospel was spreading all over the Roman Empire, and we must ensure it is spreading all over our community. Yesterday we had the opportunity of the big uh, country that was done in the community here of Siparia. So there are times where we do think within, and then there are times when you take outside. Bringing forth fruit is bearing fruit. Keep on bearing fruit. The gospel is dynamic, and this speaks of the inner energy and transforming power. It is folly to look for fruit before there is life, for by their fruit we shall know them. But when someone's life is not bearing fruit, one has to wonder if the life of Christ is in them. Because if it is, if it has life, it should bear fruit. Anything that is alive should grow naturally. If something is not growing, we have to wonder if it is an artificial plastic plant. All right, if it is artificial. Not only does it bring forth fruit, it must increase. Growing and fruit bearing 
assignment is. So I produce, but I grow as I produce. You don't stay at the same level of production. Are you done with me? There is inner growth and outward expression. The outward expression of the gospel never stops. We read in John chapter 12 and verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a, a corner of wheat fall to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth what? Much fruit. The church must germinate, not or terminate. And believers, that's our job. We either germinate or you'll be terminated. It will either evangelize or fossilize. That means it dies and just remain a monument. Well, we remember how church used to be down there. There are nothing we don't know. In a few weeks' time, this church here at Sipari will be celebrating 55 years. I just got an invitation card, so I realize that. I am sure on that day, there will be a lot of reflection. Because this is now the eighth pastor at this location. Eight is the number of new things, by the way. But yeah, seven major phases that went before. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of stories and historical successes of what has happened over those 55 years. And that's great. But running parallel to those trophies of the past, we must also be able to produce trophies now. What are we doing? To also, to also uh, put a stamp and a mark in the generation that we are living today. Alright? So, very important that we must also be able to evangelize. Since the day he heard this fruit bearing and uh, growing, begin and continue. So when the believers of Colossians heard the word of God, they started to multiply, they started to evangelize, they started to make impact. From the time they hear the word of God, they take it and they run with it. And Paul was commending them for this. Since they heard it. They knew the grace of God in truth. The grace of God was fully apprehended and should be made and made them immune to the false religious teaching of Gnosticism that existed at the time. He, as he also learned of Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was a teacher, he was a native, a person that existed in the community. He was Paul's fellow servant and a faithful minister of Christ. Who also declared, and would declare their means made manifest of your love. This is a supernatural of John chapter 3 and verse 16 and it is produced by the Holy Spirit for this cause the reason was Paul's intercession he did not cease to pray that means daily, daily and definitely so he prayed for them daily and he made sure he prayed filled with all the knowledge of his will this is available to all not for a privileged few. The thoughts, the feelings, and emotions are to be saturated with this knowledge of God's will. The word of knowledge here is in contrast to the knowledge of the religions of the world. It is full knowledge, super knowledge, total knowledge gained by experience, the depth, accurate, Comprehension. It is not just in theory, but rather by practical and by experience. Notice it is a knowledge of his will, not his nature. Let me tell you this, huh? the most difficult thing for believers really to know the will of God, to know the knowledge and the will of God. We are not expected to understand and explain the Trinity, but we are expected to understand his plan and his purpose for our life. This is the foundation of all Christian character and conduct. The cure for Gnosticism or for any of the religious teachings of the world is more knowledge of and the obedience to God's will. When is not given to satisfy curiosity. What refers to the total conduct and course 
of life. Right knowledge issued in right conduct. Right conduct is never the product of wrong knowledge. God wants his children to walk worthy, to be a credit to Christ, to live in conformity to his union with Christ, and in conformity to his purpose for our lives. Our lives should be Christ-centered. Our lives should be Christ-centered. Unto all pleasing, not pleasing everybody, but pleasing God in everything, in every way, and in all times. Be fruitful. This modified the word walk, continually bearing fruit. Christians are to be fruit bearers. In every good work, fruit in the right relationship with Christ, this is the evidence of discipleship. Increasing in the knowledge of God, this speaks of both the sphere where spiritual growth takes place and also the means of spiritual growth in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. A fruit-bearing tree grows. Ones that does not, the ones that does not grow ceases to bear fruit. Strengthened with all might, empowered by all power. We are engaged in a spiritual conflict and we need spiritual power from God. The word strengthen here in the Greek is present tense and indicate that God keeps continually and progressively filling us with dynamic power. According to his glorious power, refers to the limitless, omnipotent. The strengthening is not proportionate simply to our need, but according to his abundant supply. Unto all, thank God it of all. A threefold result of such empowerment, not working miracles, not all bursts of eloquence, but producing homely virtues. Patience remaining under. This is opposite to cowardice. It is forbearance, steadfast endurance, the capacity to see things true. That's what patience actually deals with. It's long suffering. It is opposite to wrath or vengeance. It is self sustaining, holding on long. Long suffering does not retaliate in spite of, of anger or insult. But our patience must be joyful. It is running with joyfulness. Not with a long face. Some of you are waiting for something and waiting for breakthrough and so on. You don't walk around and look like, hey, 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 long face. You're doing with joy, man. Not with a sickly smile. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people just walk around and they're looking for somebody to tell their problems. They want attention. Hey, when you're falling, when you're waiting for the things of God, you don't do it with a sickly smile. But with the Psalms in the night, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then we do it by giving thanks in verse 12. Not striving for, not praying for, but giving thanks for three things. Made us meet, that means made us fit. We are adequate, not worthy. He qualifies us, made us competent and sufficient. This is true for every Christian. There is no degree of fitness. Fitness depends on privilege and position, not character or experience. To be made partakers of his inheritance, we did not purchase that. We have a portion and shares in the inheritance of an unearned gift. That means we did not get the gift, God gave us the gift and we are all partakers of it. In light, this mark the inheritance as a future and heavenly. Life speaks of the realm where there is no night nor darkness. So here we dealt with the hope that is before you. And I just went into some of the breakdowns that are there. 
with regards to those 12 verses of scripture. Of course, we do not verse by verse study, so we are getting into the depths of it. We wouldn't even be able to do chapter one tonight. Next day, we'll do the next three chapter. Second aspect of the chapter one deals with the hope beneath you, from verse 13 to verse 33. Hope is a foundation on which you stand where, when all around you is shaken. The city of Colossae was located in an earthquake area. So Paul's admonition was especially mean, meaningful to them. The false teachers wanted the saints to shift their foundation, but Paul points the church to Jesus Christ as Savior in 13 to 14, the eternal God in verse 15, Creator in verse 16 and 17, Head of the church in verse 18. What a perfect foundation for your hope. Now in verse 13, he mentions that we have delivered us from the power of darkness. God rescued and liberated us from the power, the dominion, the authority, the tyranny of darkness. Darkness there speaks of misery, horrible state of being held captive by Satan. Darkness is a symbol of ignorance, falsehood, and sin. So in reality, it's a life we come out from. That's really where we are coming out from something. So there's a change. We are changing kingdoms. How is it done? He translated us. This is the accomplishing fact. God transported. God transplanted. God transferred us from the devil's dominion to Christ's control. It's a very powerful word that is used. Into the kingdom of his dear son, the son here is the object of the father's love. It is Christ's kingdom in which he is sovereign. God removes us from the realm of darkness and he establishes us as colonialists and citizens in the realm of light. Verse 14 says, in whom we have redemption. This is a present position. We have redemption because of our vital union with Christ. Redemption means deliverance, uh, ransom, release, emancipation. We have a public holiday here in our country for that. Redemption speaks of release on the payment for ransom. How is it done? Through his blood. The best text does not contain uh, these words. However, this truth is taught elsewhere in Scripture. This deliverance is exhibited by forgiveness of sin. This is the logical result of redemption. The real consequence of salvation. Forgiveness is remission and sending away and the removal of sin. Verse 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God? Image there ex uh, expresses Christ's deity in relation to the Father. It is the very stamp of God. As he was before the incarnation, John 17 and verse 5. The word is not form, but image. It is more a resemblance, more a representation, a manifestation, a revelation. The word in John 1.1 1, 1 is the divine person, not a philosophical this abstraction. It is in the incarnation, the invisible God becomes visible in Christ. Deity was clothed with humanity. Deity under some human limitation. Christ in God, visible, audible, approachable, knowledgeable, and available. All that God is, Christ is. So the person of God, the fullness of the person of God is now approachable because he has emptied himself of his glory. What does that make us? He's the firstborn of every creature. The expression of Christ's deity and sovereignty in relation to creation. Christ was the firstborn 
not the first created. I want for you to see that. That's very important. Because if he is created, that means he is part of creation. He is not part of creation. He is before creation. But because he is entering into creation, he is the first born. Are you there with me? First born signifies priority in time. First, this creation, but apart from creation. He is not a creator, he is not a creature, sorry, but a creator. Secondly, this speaks of supremacy in his position. He is self, he is the self-existent, knowledgeable, acknowledged head of creation. Thirdly, this also speaks of being recognized as the Messiah. So we have here declared the eternity and sovereignty and the Lordship of Christ. Verse 16 says, For by him all things are created. Three prepositions tell the story. In him has sovereign source. By him, divine agent unto him, for his use and his glory. Creation is a past, perfect work. Creation stand created, a permanent work. We have a crystal-centric universe, and this is complete denial of the Gnostics philosophy or the philosophy of many religions as well. Verse 17 says, and he is what? Before all things. Christ exists prior to all creation. He is the great I am. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, one time he talking to the Jewish people, he said, before Abraham was I am. He telling him, I am the one and true Lucifer out of heaven. So he is before all things. But also, it says, by him all things consist. Through Christ. All things hold together, cohesive, are sustained and united. Christ is the personal sustainer and preserver. He maintains harmony and order. All things are created by him and controlled by him. Apart from Christ, all things would disintegrate. He holds the stars in their courses. He directs the planets in their orbit, and he controls the laws of the universe. We have a cosmos, not a chaos, because of Christ. Verse 18 now takes us from the supernatural created world and says that he is the head of the body, which is the church. He is emphatic, he alone, and no one else. He directs, controls, guides, and governs the church. When you see things happen in church, and God will move people out, and we will see the rapid changes. Christ in charge of the church. He can move where you want and bring you where you want. All right? Because he governs, guides, and controls the church. That's why whatever we do in the kingdom of God, we must do it in harmony with him. We acknowledge him in all our ways. So he can direct the path. Why? He in charge. He in charge. The church is his body. He is his source and his life. He unites the members into one organism. So the church is an organization. There is a place for organization. We have deacons, we have board of elders, heads of department, different structure. You must have structure. The structure is both. But it is not only an organization, it is also an organism, which means it is alive. It grows. You need to put life into it. It must produce. All right? So it's an organism. And therefore, these two must always be in harmony. The church is a living organism composed of living members joined together. An organism through which Christ's word carries out his purpose. And an organism in which Christ lived. The Bible says if two or three are gathered together, he's in the midst. So not only is he in charge, but he lives within this one. He's in blood that running through every one of us. Now it goes further. He says he's the beginning and the firstborn of the dead. So 
So he's the Prince of Life, Acts chapter 3 and verse 15. The church is also a family composed of those who shared in his resurrected life. The word beginning is used in three sets prior to time. Supremacy in rank and creative initiative. Christ is not the first. Christ is not the first of all three senses. Sorry, Christ is not the first of the series, but the source. Christ is the source of the new creation and the sovereign head of the new creation. That in all things he might have what preeminence. He is emphatic, he alone, no angel in heaven, no man on earth. Christ has all shared supremacy. He has first place. He is in a class by himself. He is preeminent above all other. It is not enough for Christ to be present. He must be prominent. He must be preeminent above it all. Are you there with me? And the reason is to please the Father, His good pleasure and purpose. Verse 19 adds further. It says, For in Him should all the fullness dwell. Christ is the manifestation of God, the sovereign creator, the head of the church, the sum total of all of the power and attribute are in Christ. Let me tell you this. That means, therefore, if you were to try to explore God without Christ, you're missing the whole motive. Because in Christ is the fullness of all that God is. The Gnostics distributed the divine power amongst various eons. Paul guarded them all up in Christ. In Christ, there is divine perfection, not just a part. Not just amongst all, but all divine nature in all its fullness. In a lot of religion, they have a God for everything. So now it's one you know which one to pray for, depending on what they're praying for. Yeah, I could go to one person and anything I want here. Yes. Anything else yeah. here. The word dwells indicate permanent resident, not just a temporary visit. Only a divine person can create the world, be the head of the church, and reconcile the, uh, reconcile the world to God. So the word of God must dwell in us. Verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross. This for a specific benefit to the Gnostics again because of their theories who denied the real humanity of Christ. The blood speaks of Christ's redemptive work and the sacrificial aspect of his death. Because the blood will prove that his humanity is willing to lay aside his divinity and come down here on earth and die. He reconciled by him to reconcile unto himself. The word reconcile actually means to restore, to bring back in harmony. Divine harmony has been restored all barrier, all obstacle has been removed. God took the initiative. Religion is man seeking God. Christianity is where we have God seeking to save man. In other words, then we could have built whatever bridge we could try to cross over. We could never reach. It required God to build the bridge to come to reach us. I tell people this. Sin is an alien disease that, that, that happened in the supernatural world that came through the act of Adam and Eve and contaminated our world. No solution could be found here because the disease was from that world. It required somebody from that world to come into this world with a solution. So he came to bring restoration to us. Verse 21 says we were aliens. We were enemies. That means we were outsiders. We were hostile. We were at war with God. Where was this alienation taking place? In our minds, which is the seat of thought, attitude. Our minds were wicked towards God. The evidence can be seen in our manifestation, in our willful opposition, and in our personal vengeance against God. Verse 22 
goes on to say, in the body of his flesh, through death, that is how he destroyed sin. So the, the emphasis on the reality of his incarnation and humanity, death speaks of real suffering, not just a mere appearance. What Christ went through on the cross was real suffering as a human being. He did not die on the cross as God, he died on the cross as a man. So the suffering would have been real. There was an, an actual atonement through his birth, his baptism, his miracles, his teaching, and through his death. To be present with you means the ultimate purpose was to rest, was to bring restoration or to bring reconciliation between us and God. Holy here speaks of positive side. Christians are consecrated, dedicated, and set aside or set apart to God. Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness. We can do no good work by ourselves. But everything we do, we put on Christ. So that our work is now filtered through the righteousness of Christ. Unblameable, this is the negative side. Unblameable is a technical sacrificial term that means without flaw, free of defect, without blemish, the stainless stainless in character and uh, conduct. Unreprovable. There is no charge and no accusation either here or hereafter. All of this true is precious blood. Verse 23 tells us we are to continue in faith because of what had gone before. Provided that we assume that there is a continuance in, the, in a firm position of faith. The test of reality is steadfast in faith. There is no doubt, there is no threatening danger implied, but certain necessary condition. Paul is sure that they will continue in faith. So because of what Christ did for us, we can now continue in the faith. We are told to be grounded. That means a firm foundation. The church is built on the rock and there is no shifting. Then we should be settled. Settled means it referring to a superstructure or a firm building on a solid fashion. The church is unmovable in the terms of it being fixed. Now you may move, but the church of God will not move. Why? Because it continues in faith it is grounded, it is settled, and it shall not move away. That means there is no shifting away. The church has a stable position and shall never be dislodged. Now I know there are people that are teaching all kinds of things that cause people to move. But if you have a relationship with Christ and you understand His word, you will be able to pick up the error and you will not be moved. And you never be. All right? For the hope of the gospel, the gospel or the hope given in the gospel. We read of the hope of righteousness, the hope of his calling, the hope of eternal life, the living hope, and the hope that we have. All of these deal with the hope that we have in Christ. Wherefore I, Paul, am made also a minister. Notice Paul started by saying he's an apostle. But well, here he condescends. He comes back down and says, I am made a minister. That means I come to serve you as well. So yes, I'm the authority of an apostle. But I don't stay up in the high position. I come down to be able to serve people. Can we have a few more minutes just to wrap up the last aspect? Verse 24 to 29. The hope with him. The hope with him. Heaven is more than a destination. It is a motivation because Christ lives within. It is a lively hope, first Peter 1 and verse 3, that reflects how we think and act all day long. Because Christ is within us, we need not fear what is ahead. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Bible says whosoever have this hope purifies himself. So, you may lose positions, you may lose certain things that are there in this world, 
But because we know that we have a hope, we are not easily moved. Verse 24. Who now rejoicing in my suffering? Paul was in prison and in chain. And yet, because he was locked up, he could still rejoice because he knew for a fact heaven was his own. But he says that I rejoice for you. Not in your place, but in your interests or on behalf of you in terms of your benefit, your advantage, your affection for Christ. These were sufficient for the finished atonement. The suffering of Christ provided the gospel and salvation. The affection of Paul proclaimed the gospel and infers the servants. The affection of Paul are identified by the affection of Christ, but are on different planes. Paul's affection could add nothing to the finished work of Christ. The proclamation of the gospel transforms sinners into saints and saints into martyrs. So here we say, Christ suffered for you, that is the hope you have. I am suffering for you, but I am identifying with Christ's suffering. Paul's suffering does not add to the believer's hope. You understand that? Because Christ's hope is all that you need for your life. For my body's sake, not in the sense of atonement, but the announcing of that atonement in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, you will see that. Verse 25 says, I am made a minister. That means he becomes a servant. Paul's appointment made him a servant to the gospel. A minister of God, a minister of Christ, and a minister of the new covenant. Dispensation talks about divine order, administration, stewardship, trusteeship, this was Paul's high privilege and sacred task. Paul was a steward in God's economy, a trustee in God's household, an administrator in God's business. Paul was on the business for the king, for the king, given to you to fulfill the word of God. So it's for your benefit, your blessing. God's purpose was Paul's purpose. And God's word was Paul's message. Therefore, Paul's message was pure and uncorrupted by false teaching. So here is how he maintained in showing that he kept pure teaching. He taught the word of God only. And by maintaining and staying within God's word alone, without adding the teachings of other religious group, he knew for a fact that he taught the pure word of God and was uncorrupted. Alright? And that is how when you're sharing as well, that is how you will also share the word. Verse 26 says, even the mystery, that's the sacred secret, there is, there is no connection here with mystery religion. Hid, which means it's unknown in the past, once concealed, but now it is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Manifested, mean clear as day. To his saints, that is to all born again Christians. Verse 27, to whom? God was pleased to make the mystery known. God's will, God's will this, change from hidden mystery to manifestation. Riches means glorious wealth. Christ in you, the indwelling Christ, Christ is the answer, not the law, not circumcision, not ceremonies, not philosophy, not scientists, not social reform. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Hope of glory is a pledge for the future. Verse 28, whom we preach, Paul did not proclaim precepts, creed, code of ethics, rules of a religion or regulation, not a plan, not a program, but a person. He preached Christ and him crucified. Then there is a warning, addressing, admonishing the heart, reproving and convincing of error. This is referred to conduct that leads to repentance. Teaching addresses the intelligent, informing and instructing in faith the more. Paul's aim and purpose to every man, this is a repeat three times for emphasis. 
Paul has no narrow exclusive such as in Gnostics. He is preaching to everyone. Teach everybody where to have go. Perfect in Christ Jesus, not sinless, but perfect, complete, full grown, and mature. It was Paul's goal. He says that he labored with his strength in sharing the word. And his work, or his working, which is the divine energy, supernatural power in Paul, and through Paul, Paul was God's instrument to do God's work, through God's power, and for God's glory. We're going to stop here tonight at the end of chapter 1 as we are still in the doctrinal side of the book of Colossians. Next day we'll wrap up the first half which is chapter 2 and then chapter 3 and chapter 4 we are going to get into the practical side of the book of Colossians. Amen? So you have your manuals with you. Uh, if you're looking at this DVD, let's say pick up this DVD and you'd like to get a copy of this, you can send us an email at anointingoildynamics at yahoo.com and we will email the manual to you so that you will be able to follow along the DVD as well. Let me just pray and close up this session tonight. Next week we will conclude with the second part as we look at chapter 2, chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the book of Colossians. Father, we thank you, Lord, that in Christ there are many benefits. Many benefits. We thank you, Lord, that it is not by might nor by power, but by your Holy Spirit. And we know, O oh Lord, that in you we live and move and have our being. We thank you, Lord, for the riches that we have in Christ. And I pray as individuals here in Siparia, and even those that are looking at us, via DVD, the Lord we will understand the riches and the wealth and the depth we have in Christ. So that Lord we will not give up Christ for anything that is in the world. For we have the fullness of the Godhead and the fullness of all benefits that are there. Bless us even now as we leave this place we pray that you will continue to watch over us in Jesus mighty name. Amen and Amen. If you did not pick up one of these, we still have others in the back that you can get. It's Pastor Bino, over to you. You will close off the session. Please.